Hey everybody, this is Dr. Dune from Colorado Surgical Institute, and today I have the lovely Michaela here. She's been with me for, what is it now? Seven years. Seven years. Mm -hmm. Seven best years of your life? Uh, I'll say yes on camera. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to be going over our surgical kits here. Uh, so this is what we use every single day in surgery. Uh, so I'm just going to start from right to left and then uh, feel free to, to interject and say, hey, you know how we use this and, and all of the above. Okay. The reason why we're doing this video is twofold. A, for educational purposes for, for everyone out there. But two, it's going to be for the Colorado Surgical Institute courses. They are very busy courses and we want you to watch these videos ahead of time so you can have the knowledge on what you're going to be using in the surgeries when you come to one of the courses. We have a double action rongeur. And so we'll use this mainly for bone reduction. Really? That's really the only thing, right? Do you yeah, ever see me use it for any? Yeah, the thing is when, with the double hinge here, it, it's too much pressure into the tooth if you try to remove a root tip. There's, you know, you can maybe grab some soft tissue with it, but then you're gonna dull the blade here, and this blade needs to be there to just remove bone and do autogenous harvesting. So what we'll do is we'll harvest autogenous bone We'll save it in a, like a stainless steel dish that has saline in it so it can stay hydrated throughout the procedure. And then you've done your autogenous grafting and, um, and then you can hydrate it. So what, what's autogenous bone? It's osteoinductive, it's osteoconductive, and it's osteogenic and it's free. So you're gonna save all this autogenous bone and then we'll need a bone grinder to come in and, and actually morselize it to the point where you can use it back in your osteotomies. Oftentimes we're mixing it with cortical cancellus. Yeah. Yeah? And then you got your little baby rongeurs, okay? <laughs> this is gonna be good for like little root tips, but then also I think it's really good if you have all that excess papilla. You know, if you have yeah. all that granulomatous infection. tissue, infection tissue, you just mm -hmm. take this, rip all that crap out of there. Yeah. So this is good to just get small bits out of there. You got little tissue tags on the bone. You can go ahead and get that out of there. These are our surgical scissors. Sometimes you might wanna keep one or two of these in your kit. We just use one. But at the end of the day, uh, Mac, what are we using those for? Um, sometimes you cut the um, excess tissue with it, um, but basically just to cut the suture. Suture? And then sometimes, sometimes PRF? Cut the PRF, yep. Yeah. And you see how this one has a curve to it? So when you have the curved iris scissors, when you go cut your sutures, you want to go in with that curved part pointing up. It's going to make it easier to cut your sutures versus having the curved part facing down and then cutting sutures. Yeah, cut them as short as possible. Um, for the assistance because then those bug the uh, patient. Yeah, and if and when you're suturing, I know this is not necessarily the premise of today's video, but if you can have the knot on the buckle, so when you suture, pull the knot to the buckle or tie the knot on the buckle because that way the patient's not going to feel the knot with their tongue. It drives them freaking nuts. So if you can, uh, those are some suturing tips and then that's the scissors we use. So these are smaller hemostats. I'm gonna use these smaller hemostats in surgery to grab parts and pieces, and I'm gonna use them to grab the soft tissue and to stop a bleed. I'm gonna use bigger hemostats to suture, so we keep those separate in another kit because I use really big uh, needle drivers to suture with, or you can use your Castros. The Castros, a lot of people like them. It's just whatever works better in your hands. I use Castros for years, and then all of a sudden I switched over to the big needle drivers, and I could go either way. At the end of the day, it's whatever gets the job done uh, for you. Okay. What are these, like college pliers, cotton pliers? Cotton whatever they're, pliers. Cotton pliers, whatever they're called. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess I just use that to grab PRF. Uh, yeah, I say mainly I use them. I help you um, suture oh. with them. I'll grab the end that he's going to go grab with his needle nose. And then just to, like, feed it to him, he goes quicker. Um, otherwise, that's, yeah, cut PRF with it. That's a huge pro tip. If your dental assistant can grab the tail of the suture when it's just flapping around in there and pull it closer to you, you're going to suture like twice as fast. So just make sure that you use that one tip over there. Um, I also will use this sometimes if I do like a, if I'm trying to approximate the tissue, I'll grab the tissue with the Adson forceps and the cotton pliers or college pliers, grab those, and I'll try to reapproximate the tissue in a way where I can see where the passivity of the tissue is. And then this is my go-to. So this one I'm gonna use like all the time. I literally just have this thing in my left hand almost all day long. Mm -hmm. I'm pulling tissue out of the way. I'm reflecting with it. I'm suturing with it. 
Um, this really helps. Even if I'm placing an implant, I'll hold the tissue out of the way here and I'll place my implant and I can reflect with it too. So I really like this. This is almost like part of my left hand at this point. <laughs> so curette, uh, you can get some different sizes, but this is just the one we stock in all of them. And you, every time you pull a tooth, you're going to need to curette the extraction site thoroughly. You need to get the PDL out of that extraction site. So your curette and the types of curettes you have are going to be important. Uh, you can also get a degranulation burr kit. So you get different burrs that can go into a handpiece that go to the bottom of the apex of those sockets. And it just scoops out all the infection tissue and it gets all that stuff out of there. But your curettes are going to go a long way to cleaning out soft tissue from areas where bone graft is going to hit. So if you're going to do a buccal bone graft, you're going to go ahead and add, uh, you're going to curette all the tissue off of the, the buccal bone, and then you're going to add your bone graft on top. Mm -hmm. um, do we use this for anything else? Nope, that's it. Yeah, maybe like, maybe holding tissue out of the way, you know. tucking your PRF. Yeah, okay, so Michaela will use this a lot too. So, you know, she'll like push the PRF a certain way or she'll help hold down the membrane uh, when I'm suturing. So this can be used in a lot of different ways. It's very versatile because it's curved and can get out of the way when you're trying to like, you know, prep an osteotomy or do anything technical. Root tip picks, um, we don't use them that often, mm -mm. but you do need them every once in a while. And oftentimes, like when I was younger, I would just kind of use it like this now i kind of hold it like this and i am jamming that sucker in there and i'm cranking on it i'm cranking on this thing because you got to get this like sharp tip underneath the root and you got to pry those suckers out just make sure you know the anatomy for the patient so you're not going to push it into the sinus or into the a ian or into the sub submandibular space or anything like that 15 you could have one or two of these i think we go through what two to three yeah. 15s um, per procedure I rarely use a 12, but, and I don't really use the, the, the ruler here, uh, but at the end of the day, it's pretty standard for your uh, scalpel. Perioprobe and Explorer. I think it's nice to have every once in a while. The Perioprobe I'd like to just take quick measurements with. I think it's good to have in every single kit. By the time you run your surgical kit a couple of times, all these get bent because you're kind of prying them in different places, but it serves its purpose. Mirror, do we ever use a mirror in surgery? Uh, I don't think so, no. Yeah, I mean, don't use a mirror in surgery. I would say maybe the only time I use this is if we're going into the sinus, mm -hmm. and then I got to look in a specific direction to see if the membrane's intact. Outside of that, I, I will, it's very infrequent that I'm going to use this, but I guess we stock it in every kit. And this is this is the winner. Out of, I think everything, right? Yeah. Our favorite. That's why I like so, it for last. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you got the boozer. One end is this spade. It's really sharp. You can jam it into places and pop out like infection. You can jam it in places, pop out root tips. And you can also go into like a papilla and you can flip out a papilla really easily. And let's say you cut through the tissue with a 15 and you can't get the tissue off. Instead of putting down the instrument and picking up a scalpel, you can just take this sharp end, score it across the bone, and then it usually release, releases all those little tissue fibers that is holding your tissue in place. And then you got the rounded end. I mean, this is how I do the vast majority of my reflection everywhere except for the palate, where I just come in and I'll scrape with this rounded end of the boozer. And it is by far, I think, my favorite instrument. Mm -hmm. And I think from the perspective of uh, a gift we give you guys, because it's so important in how we do surgery at Colorado Surgical, um, as an attendee, we, we gift you one of these as well. You got the Sweetheart Retractor. So... Sweetheart retractor is usually just laid in there to retract the tongue. And then sometimes if you have six hands in your surgery, Michaela will be doing her thing, I'll be doing my thing, and we have another assistant who's pulling that tongue up and out of the way. It works really well in wisdom teeth, really well for all surgeries, and especially patients where you're doing full arch and they have a really big tongue because there's potentially some apnea issues. This is gonna hold the big tongue out of the way. You might have to get like a throat pack or some four by fours and the sweetheart to hold everything out of the way but that works really well. And then of course you got your Minnesotas. I like two per kit. Um, you know, you can tell if you do a lot of surgery, if your Minnesotas are beat up. So at the end of the day, don't worry if you nick them with things, that's what they're for. Um, but Minnesotas are gonna be your go-to for retraction in the vast majority of your procedures. There's a lot of different other types of retractors. So at the end of the day, if you like a Selden or you like different retractors, that's fine. Uh, but this is kind of the go-to and it's pretty standard um, throughout surgery in the industry. And then we always have two 
uh, anesthetic um, what, syringes. Mm -hmm. So I'm over here. I am injecting. Michaela's reloading. And then I hand it back to her and she hands it to me and boom. So we just do see -si do on this. So I can just deliver the anesthetic as quick as possible. If the patient is deeply sedated, I'm actually going to go heavy handed with the anesthetic because I'm going to kind of pump that sucker in there because it's going to get a stimulus to the patient and the anesthesiologist will get to see their reaction. So you don't have to go low and slow if the patient is sedated. Now, if the patient is not sedated, still anesthetized the way we were taught, it's really slow. But sometimes you want to stimulate the patient in a way where we can see a response in the monitor. And so delivering the anesthetic quickly is going to be important for that. And also having someone who's a quick reload is going to be important because then you can just go and get the anesthetic done in a timely fashion. And then also from a perspective of uh, needles to use, uh, we do 130 and 127. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one blue and one yellow. Um, Sometimes we'll start with um, seatness mm. to lower the epinephrine for the patient. Yep. Um, and then we go to septicane or marking. Yep. Beautiful. Yeah. And so if you have any like BP issues or cardio issues, like Michaela said, lowering the amount of epinephrine you're going to give them right off the bat is going to be important. And then two for your progress notes, if you're going to give 16 carpules over four hours, you can't write just you gave them 16 carpules. You're going to have to write down when it was administered because if a board looks at your anesthetic delivery, they're going to say, okay, well, you gave them 16 at one time. Well, no, I gave them eight. And then three hours later, I gave them another eight. So be specific because if you said you gave them 16 in one sitting, you've actually given them too much and you've exceeded the dosages and then the board could come down with some ruling against you. Mm -hmm. So again, this is our surgical setup. There's a few other things or there's quite a few other things we have in every procedure. But this, if you have these major things over here, you can almost do any single procedure out there. Mm -hmm.